Imagine standing on the flight deck of the USS Nimitz in the year 2005. The salty wind whips across the steel plating, carrying the scent of jet fuel and ozone. But the aircraft sitting on the catapult isn't the familiar hunchbacked silhouette of the F-14 Tomcat, nor is it the boxy, utilitarian shape of the F-18 Hornet. It is something alien. It is sleek, jagged, and painted in a radar-absorbing haze gray. As the steam builds pressure, the pilot pushes the throttle and the afterburners ignite with a blue-violet fury. But just as the shuttle fires, the wings of this machine do something unexpected. They sweep forward. This is the Naval Advanced Tactical Fighter, the Sea Raptor. It is a variable geometry swing-wing stealth fighter that combines the invisibility of the F-22 with the carrier-borne swagger of the F-14. It is the ultimate air superiority machine designed to hunt Soviet bombers over the open ocean and kick down the door of any airspace on Earth. It is also a plane that never happened. In the annals of military aviation history, the Naval Advanced Tactical Fighter remains one of the most compelling ghosts. It is a story of engineering hubris, bitter inter-service rivalry, and the collision of Cold War paranoia with post-Cold War budget realities. Today, we peel back the layers of classified proposals and forgotten blueprints to unveil the monster that almost ruled the waves, the Navy's F-22. To understand why the Navy flirted with the idea of a Sea Raptor, we have to go back to the mid-1980s. The Cold War was freezing over, and the United States Navy faced a terrifying threat. The Soviet Union had developed a maritime strike force designed to delete American carrier battle groups from existence. The threat came in the form of the Tupolev T-22M backfire bomber. These high-speed swing-wing bombers were designed to launch massive swarms of AS-4 Kitchen anti-ship cruise missiles from hundreds of miles away. The Navy's strategy to counter this was the F-14 Tomcat, armed with the long-range AIM-54 Phoenix missile. The Tomcat's job was to play goalie, to fly far ahead of the carrier, track the incoming bombers with its massive radar, and shoot them down before they could launch their missiles. But by the late 80s, the Pentagon worried that the Tomcat was losing its edge. Soviet technology was catching up. Their missiles were getting faster, their jammers better. The Navy needed a successor to the F-14, something faster, deadlier, and, crucially, invisible. If the Navy fighter was stealthy, the Soviet bombers wouldn't know they were being intercepted until it was too late. At the same time, the U.S. Air Force was developing its own replacement for the F-15 Eagle, the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, which would eventually spawn the F-22 Raptor. Congress, looking at the ballooning costs of developing two separate superfighters, had a bright idea. They forced the Air Force and the Navy into a shotgun marriage. They mandated that the winner of the Air Force competition must also be adaptable for the Navy. The goal was to save money through commonality. It sounded great on paper. In reality, it sparked an engineering war. Turning a land-based stealth fighter into a carrier-based aircraft is not like modifying a car for off-road use. It is more like trying to turn a Formula One race car into a monster truck without losing any speed. The F-22 Raptor, or its prototype, the YF-22, was a thoroughbred sprinter. It was designed to fly from long, smooth, concrete runways in Europe. It was lightweight, relatively speaking, and aerodynamic. A carrier landing is essentially a controlled car crash. The aircraft hits the deck at 150 miles per hour and slams onto the steel plates, catching a wire that jerks it to a halt in two seconds. The force is violent enough to snap a regular airplane in half. To survive this, a naval fighter needs heavy-duty landing gear, massive struts and wheels capable of absorbing the impact, a tail hook, a reinforced hook and structural keel to catch the wire, strengthened fuselage to handle the stress of the catapult launch and the arresting gear recovery, corrosion resistance 
protection against the relentless metal-eating saltwater spray. All of these things add immense weight, and in the world of fighter jets, weight is death. But the biggest problem was the wings. The Air Force's F-22 had a fixed diamond-shaped wing optimized for supersonic cruise and stealth, but that wing was too fast for a carrier. To land on a boat, you need to fly slowly, very slowly. A fixed delta wing like the Raptors would require a terrifyingly high landing speed, making it dangerous to bring aboard. The solution? The engineers at Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics looked at the F-14 Tomcat and stole its best trick, swing wings. The proposed NATF-22 was a radical departure from its Air Force cousin. While it shared the nose, the engines, the Pratt & Whitney F-119s, and the avionics of the F-22, the rest of the airframe was unrecognizable. Drawings and wind tunnel models revealed a machine that looked like the illicit love child of an F-22 and an F-14. It featured variable geometry wings that would sweep forward for low-speed maneuvering, allowing it to take off from a catapult and land safely and sweep back against the fuselage for supersonic flight. This design choice was the only way to meet the Navy's conflicting requirements, the ability to loiter for hours on combat air patrol, cap efficiently, wings out, and the ability to dash at Mach 2 to intercept Soviet bombers, wings back. However, swing wings are an engineer's nightmare. They require heavy pivot mechanisms, complex hydraulics, and a glove area where the wing retracts into the body. For a stealth fighter, this is catastrophic. The gaps and seams where the wing moves are massive radar reflectors. To maintain the F-22's Very Low Observable, or VLO, stealth rating, Lockheed would have had to design complex sliding seals that could maintain a smooth surface while the wing was moving. It was a technological high-wire act that had never been attempted. As the engineers crunched the numbers, the NATF-22 started to look less like a fighter jet and more like a flying brick. The structural reinforcements and the swing wing mechanism added thousands of pounds of weight. To compensate for the extra weight, the engines needed more thrust, or the wing area needed to be increased. But increasing the size meant the plane wouldn't fit on the carrier's elevators or inside the hangar deck. It was a vicious cycle. The projected cost of the aircraft began to skyrocket. Meanwhile, the culture clash between the Air Force and Navy was reaching a boiling point. The Navy has always been skeptical of Air Force designs. They viewed the F-22 as a fragile, gold-plated toy that wouldn't last a week in the brutal saltwater environment. Naval aviators wanted a tough, two-seat brawler like the Tomcat, not a single-seat stealth assassin. The NATF-22 was going to be a single-seat aircraft, which the Navy hated for long-range intercept missions. They believed a radar intercept officer, or RIO, in the backseat was essential for managing the complex battle space Think Top Gun's Goose. It is important to remember that Lockheed wasn't the only one playing this game. Their competitor in the Air Force program, Northrop McDonnell Douglas, had the YF-23 Black Widow II. Northrop also proposed a naval variant, the NATF-23. The naval Black Widow was arguably an even stranger beast. The YF-23 was already a massive aircraft with a unique diamond wing. To make it carrier-capable, Northrop proposed a canard configuration, adding small forewings near the nose to generate extra lift for landing. The NATF-23 would have looked like a futuristic space plane, lacking the vertical tail fins of traditional fighters, relying on advanced rudders and thrust vectoring. Like the Sea Raptor, the naval Black Widow suffered from the same issues. It was too heavy, too expensive, and too complex for the rough-and-tumble life of a carrier deck. By 1991, the writing was on the wall. The Berlin Wall had fallen. The Soviet Union dissolved. The terrifying swarms of backfire bombers that kept admirals awake at night vanished, essentially overnight. The strategic imperative for a super-expensive, high-performance stealth interceptor evaporated, essentially overnight. 
Simultaneously, the Navy was dealing with its own self-inflicted disaster, the A-12 Avenger II. This was a separate program to build a stealthy flying wing bomber to replace the A-6 intruder. The A-12 program was a catastrophe of mismanagement and cost overruns, eventually being canceled by Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney in 1991. The failure of the A-12 made the Pentagon extremely gun-shy about clean-sheet stealth aircraft for the Navy. With the Cold War over and the budget shrinking, the Navy looked at the NATF-22 and saw a money pit. They decided to bail out. They officially abandoned the stealth requirement and the connection to the Air Force's F-22 program. Instead, they chose the safe, affordable, and pragmatic option. They took their existing horsepower, the F-A-18 Hornet, and made it bigger. The result was the F-A-18E-F Super Hornet. It wasn't stealthy, though it had some radar-reducing features. It wasn't Mach 2 fast, and it wasn't revolutionary. But it was reliable, it worked on a carrier, and it was cheap enough to buy in bulk. The dream of the Sea Raptor died, buried in a drawer of classified documents, leaving the F-14 Tomcat to retire without a direct high-performance successor. Fast forward to the 2020s, the geopolitical wheel has turned full circle. The United States is once again facing a great power competition, this time with China. The Pacific theater is vast, and the threat of long-range anti-ship missiles like the DF-21 and DF-26 has returned with a vengeance. In hindsight, the cancellation of the NATF-22 looks like a strategic tragedy. The current carrier air wing is composed of Super Hornets and the new F-35C Lightning II. While the F-35C is stealthy and incredibly smart, it lacks the raw speed and kinematic performance of the Raptor. It is a strike fighter, not an air dominance machine. It cannot supercruise, fly at supersonic speeds without afterburner like the Raptor can. If the Navy had built the Sea Raptor, American carriers today would be launching Mach 2 stealth fighters capable of dominating the airspace thousands of miles from the fleet, untouchable by enemy defenses. The range gap that currently plagues the Navy, where Chinese missiles outrange U.S. carrier aircraft, would be significantly narrower. The ghost of the Sea Raptor still haunts naval planners. It is the reason the Navy is currently frantically developing the FAXX, the next generation air dominance fighter. If you look at the requirements for the FAXX, extreme range, high speed, stealth, and air to air supremacy, it sounds remarkably like they're trying to build the plane they canceled in 1991. The plane that never was. The NATF 22 remains one of the greatest what ifs in aviation. It represents a brief moment in time when American engineering ambition knew no bounds, where we seriously considered putting a swing-wing, thrust-vectoring stealth spaceship on a boat. Visually, it would have been the most aggressive, intimidating aircraft ever to launch from a catapult. The image of a Sea Raptor wings swept forward bathed in steam on the deck of the Enterprise is a piece of alternate history that aviation enthusiasts still dream about. It was killed by peace, it was killed by budget cuts, but mostly it was killed by the laws of physics, which dictated that you can have a stealth fighter or you can have a carrier fighter. But trying to make one plane do both in the 1990s was a bridge too far. Today, as the Navy looks to the future, they are finally ready to build the air to the Sea Raptor, proving that while you can kill a program, you can never kill the need for absolute dominance of the skies. Enjoyed the episode? Like and subscribe to Military Forces. For more in-depth content, your support helps us create more.